This is an Australian man detained now for seven months without charge and facing now an espionage charge that can carry the death penalty. For more, I'm joined now by the Shadow Foreign Minister, Penny Wong. Thanks for your time this afternoon. Look, uh, we, we just heard the Foreign Minister there saying today she, uh, there is no reason to think this arrest is connected to other issues. Do you agree this may not be uh, any sort of retaliation from China? This may have more to do with uh, what Yang Heng Jun himself has been writing and saying about China. Well, David, first, good afternoon. Good to be with you. I want to start by saying how dismayed and concerned Labor is about Dr Young's detention and I want to express our support for the family. It's a very difficult time. The question you raise goes to the reasons for Dr Young's uh, detention and what I would say is this. Uh, in circumstances where uh, it is not clear uh, what the reasons for his detention are, uh, in circumstances where the Foreign Minister, as she has said publicly, notes that there is no basis for any allegation that he has been spying on behalf of the Australian Government. It's inevitable that there will be public speculation about the reasons for his detention. We continue to call, join, join the Foreign Minister and the Government's call for uh, uh, him to be treated appropriately, for reasons for his detention to be clarified. And we repeat our call, as is the Government's call, that is, if he is being held uh, for political reasons, for his political views, uh, then he should be released. Now, as you know, there's a debate, there always is, about the best approach, whether quiet diplomacy is the best way to go or the sort of public pressure that we've certainly seen over the last couple of days. What do you think? That's a judgment governments uh, must make. We have an Australian citizen uh, who has been detained here. That is a very serious matter. And the government of the day uh, should make the best assessment it can, uh, taking in all the advice from... Uh, the uh, public servants and agencies about the best way to proceed. And the responsible opposition of the day, and that is us, uh, obviously has been briefed by the government and should, uh, I think, take the same approach as the government in these sorts of circumstances. So, uh, yeah, I think, I I think, so you do, you I think, do talk I think about there's... the best approach in matters like this. Presumably in the last couple of days you've talked about uh, you know, what sort of public pressure needs to be applied. Uh, I think we've made clear our position publicly, as has the government. Uh, and what is important here is to recognise that there's this situation regarding um, uh, Dr Young uh, and that is very concerning. Uh, and you know, I've, I've made a number of comments about that and, and uh, we continue to join in calls for his release if he has been uh, held for political reasons and to ensure also, uh, uh, to assert our expectation that he's treated appropriately. There is a broader point here. Uh, Australia is entitled uh, with any country to make sure we protect our sovereignty, that we assert our interests and our values. And that is what the government should do and is doing, and that is what we will do and will continue to do. Do you think it's safe right now to travel to China if you are someone who's been publicly critical of the Chinese Communist Party? I would urge Australians to look at the travel advice. The government did update the travel advice earlier this year, uh, and that advice reflects the, the, the government's view uh, that and I think the self-evident fact uh, relating to the way in which laws are interpreted uh, and uh, the, the potential uh, concerns which might arise about the application of those laws. So I, I would urge Australians to look at the advice uh, that is given by the government in relation to this travel as in any other travel. Would you expect a further review though after these developments? Look, I, I take the view in terms of travel advice that it, uh, I'm very wary of, of making pronouncements, uh, public pronouncements as a politician. Uh, the travel advice is worked through by officials. They do so carefully and uh, I'm sure, given the circumstances, they will consider uh, the travel advice. As I said, it was uh, updated recently, uh, I think subsequent to, to the detention of this Australian citizen. Can I leave the, the case of Yang Heng Jun there and, and just more broadly on China and the trade war uh, that's been playing out? The Prime Minister says we've gone over a tipping point now and we're now in a new era in which China is an advanced developed economy, uh, no longer a developing economy. Does Labor agree with that? Well, I, I, think, I think China uh, is certainly in a very different place to where it was when it ascended to the WTO. Uh, uh, you know, obviously, there are still a, a lot of development which is occurring, but it's in a very, very different economic place. But I think that that 
that particular detail is not the only issue. Mm -hmm. The broader issue is this, and that is uh, we have a, a very different global economy. Uh, the weight of um, the, the Chinese economy is very different to uh, that which it was when the WTO was put in place. It is reasonable to ensure that our trade arrangements, our trade rules are fit for purpose. Uh, and uh, it is a good thing for us to work through those and to, to try and reform the WTO and, and relevant trading arrangements to reflect those facts. But it is an important definition, not just with World Trade Organisation rules, but also emissions. Uh, developed countries have very different uh, well, expectations than developing countries when it comes to lowering emissions. So, so again, I mean, do you think China is still a developing country or a developed country? Uh, well, well, look, uh, I, I, I was climate minister, as you might recall, I and, do recall. and I made the point. <laughs> I, I, I made the point uh, uh, that, that these labels are, are less important than the broader point, which is we all have to contribute uh, to reducing global emissions, and China has to be a part uh, of uh, any solution on climate change, as does the United States. Yeah, I, I, uh, and I think we, I think you we mentioned would do your, your well time in... as, as climate minister. I remember being in Copenhagen uh, there when and you and Kevin Rudd that all night negotiation. And part of it was this very sticking point: is China a developed or a developing country? That was some years ago. They've grown a lot since then, obviously. Uh, but, but I don't think that's the precise point in relation to emissions. I mean, I think the point is all countries need to. to uh, all countries need to contribute to mm. the the world dealing with climate. Uh, dealing with the climate crisis we see, and things have worsened since Copenhagen. Uh, but look, uh, China is a, a great power. Uh, with that comes uh, influence, but also comes responsibilities, whether they are in trade or in, in climate, just as uh, other major uh, economies uh, and other great nations, including the world superpower, the US, uh, has obligations yeah, I, and responsibilities. I, I... Australia's national interest, I'll just make two points, Australia's national interest on both these fronts, firstly in relation to trade. You know, we're a substantial economy, a substantial nation and a trading nation. We have an interest in fair, transparent, open trading arrangements. We don't have an interest in, a, uh, in, the, in, in, in the, the winner takes all, a winner takes all approach. In relation to climate, we're a country which is vulnerable to climate change. Yeah, no, I appreciate uh, as that. As are many Look, countries, and, and all have to be yeah. part of the solution. I, I don't want to make too much of this, but the prime minister is now saying China's an advanced, developed country. It just sounds to me like Labor is not actually recognising China as an advanced, oh. developed country necessarily. Is that, is that oh. fair? I think in many ways they are, but it is true that there is still a lot of development which has to occur. One of the great things for humanity uh, has been China's capacity yeah. to lift many millions of, of uh, uh, people out of poverty. Can I turn uh, to... But I, I yeah. think... Sorry, sorry. No, I've I'll, made the point. You okay. No, no, no. Yeah. I'll turn to Iran. Labor last week backed the government's decision to uh, send a frigate and a surveillance plane to help patrol the Strait of Hormuz. Um, this was uh, clearly discussed at the G7 summit in France, but it is still only the US, the UK, Australia and Bahrain that are involved in what's meant to be a multinational mission. Does it concern you that more countries haven't joined? Every country will make its decision as to its national interests, and I, I can't comment, obviously we're not in government, as to where those decisions and discussions are up, up to. Uh, I'd make a couple of points. The, the first is a very important point, I think, about the JCPOA or the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, Labor has continued, as has the government, to support that arrangement as the best way to avert a nuclear-armed Iran. And I think it is very important that we separate out this operation, uh, which is an operation focused on freedom of navigation and the security of civilian ships, from the broader Iran policy issue, where uh, Australia has the same view as the United Kingdom, which is we continue to support mm. the JCPOA. CPOA. Well, yes, but when it comes to this mission, which we're told is separate, but is also a multinational mission, as I say, there hasn't exactly been a flood of others jumping on board since uh, we made our commitment. Is that a concern? Would you like to see more join up to this to give it that international uh, flavour? I, I think countries have to make their own decisions. Uh, I would say that we believe freedom of navigation uh, is an important principle, uh, and Australia has a national interest uh, in, in asserting those rights uh, and in asserting uh, the cogency and um, you know, the application of those principles. A couple of domestic matters, just uh, quickly. Uh, the ICAC hearing in Sydney that's been underway again today. Look, there's a bit of back and forth over who knew what about this 
bag of cash that was allegedly handed over from the Chinese billionaire Huang Zhangmo. Is there a problem when it comes to the culture uh, in the party of, of taking donations that, well, you know, rules can be avoided, uh, rules can be ignored um, uh, to, to ensure the money is still coming in? Is that a problem, do you think, with, when it comes to the culture in the Labor Party? Uh, well, I also remember ICAC investigating uh, donations being funnelled uh, from developers and other and like being funnelled through other Liberal Party entities. I, I'd make that point. The general principle is and should be that electoral disclosure laws should be complied with. That is the expectation. Uh, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd also make the point that federally Labor argued for uh, the ban on foreign donations. I personally did. Uh, uh, Don Farrell, our Special Minister of State spokesperson, also did continue to argue for a ban on foreign donations for uh, a, a, a couple of years prior to the government finally acting on it, which they finally did. Uh, I do think electoral laws, can, uh, disclosure laws can be improved. Uh, I think that we can reduce the threshold for uh, donation disclosure. Uh, it's too high at the moment. Labor's been arguing it for, for it to be reduced uh, and for real-time disclosure. And I think that would certainly contribute to better public confidence in the system. Well, you talk about public confidence. Let me ask you this. Um, you know, clearly, when uh, rules are broken, that brings down the reputation of all politicians. Uh, should someone who deliberately breaks donation rules be expelled from the party? <laughs> well, let, let's... That's, I think, a hypothetical, but I know where you're going. What, what I'd say to you is... Uh, this, this is a, a hearing. Uh, I'm not going to comment on every day of evidence. Uh, and uh, when ICAC makes its findings in relation to these matters, I'm sure those will be considered very closely by, by the New South Wales branch and the party more broadly. Well, I, uh, OK, let me finish with John Setka, who, of course, Labor does want to, or at least Anthony Albanese, wants to expel uh, from the party. Yesterday, he lost his uh, uh, court challenge to stop that happening. So when will he be expelled? Well, that's a matter for the National Executive. Uh, uh, obviously, they will deal with uh, this matter uh, at the leader's request, at Mr Albanese's request, and it's a request I think, I, well, I support and I think is consistent with where most Australians would be. Uh, I, I'd make at this point. I, I've seen some commentary that Mr Seck is entitled to his private life. People are entitled to their private life. Uh, but when uh, you are convicted of harassment, when you breach a family violence order, these matters are not private matters. I think privacy ends where there is abuse and violence uh, and breaches of the law. Uh, and Mr Albanese is doing the right thing uh, in seeking to ensure that Mr Setka's membership is terminated. And to be clear on that, it's because of those convictions that he's being expelled, in your view? Oh, look, I'm not a member of the National Executive and I don't want to be drawn on how they will go through that decision-making process after the court has demonstrated they've got the power. Uh, I think you know, there is a broad question uh, about whether or not his actions have brought the party into disrepute. But I'm making a point uh, that we all, I think, should observe about violence and abuse. Uh, those are not private matters. Penny Wong, Shadow Foreign Minister and Labor Senate Leader, appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank you. Good to speak with you.